Duke Professor Judith Kelly is the author of Monitoring Democracy When International Election Observation Works and Why It Often Fails. Professor Kelly, when did international election monitoring come into vogue? It really started taking off in the late 80s, beginning 90s, the late 80s. I think, um, you know, there had been election monitoring under UN regimes in different ways uh, with uh, decolonizations and things like this, but this was a new, a new flavor of it where it really was outsiders going into sovereign states monitoring their elections. And, uh, and, and the way it came into vogue and the way it, it, it rose is very important for understanding how it works today. So um, uh, I initially, uh, we had a lot of governments at towards the end of the Cold War that had not been, of course, democratic, and now wanted to show off their, their intentions to behave more democratically. And so they had an incentive to invite monitors in, uh, even, even though this is sort of a sacred thing. It's, it's, the, it's the heart of democracy, one could say. It's the heart of sovereignty. But then to invite somebody in and say, are we doing our core exercise of electing our government the right way. They had an incentive to do that because if they, uh, you know, they oftentimes, uh, especially towards the end of the Cold War, there were so many uh, of the old timers that continued into the new government that they needed this external verification. Uh, and so uh, invitations started to become more common to monitors. And, and as this was happening, uh, this odd dynamic started happening where the ones that had no incentive to write monitors in the ones that were not uh, with honest intentions started looking obviously bad for not doing so. It became almost like a self-declaration of cheating. And so you get this tipping where if you don't invite somebody in, now you look bad. And so now more and more countries start uh, inviting monitors in. And that starts to, creating, uh, uh, starts to create a dilemma too of who should be the monitors, like where should this authority reside in the global community? And there was a push to have that reside uh, within the United Nations for a long time. But a lot of Latin American countries were you know, quite wary. They had the OAS, which had been doing sort of mm, formal symbolic monitoring for a long time. And, and this was sort of a Western push, and they didn't, they didn't want that. And there was a pushback uh, uh, on, on the UN being uh, the watchdog, the overall monitor. And that led to uh, a, stead, a fragmentation of the monitoring regime. So it, it, it became regional organizations, it became NGOs that took off this, uh, took up this mantle of, of monitoring, which then has led to a lot of, of issues down the road of, of who gets to act as a monitor and are they all uh, of equal quality. Where, yeah. where today does the authority lie? N nowhere, nowhere really, and that's fascinating. There's no uh, accreditation that an international monitor, uh, monitoring organization Should has to get. It would probably be a good idea. There is a declaration of principles that came out of the United Nations, and some organizations have signed on to that, but that doesn't um, in any way guarantee that they abide by it. Right? They could just sign on to it. Uh, there's no um, auditing of whether they're actu fo actually following the practices that that declaration um, seeks to, uh, you know, aspires to. Uh, but then, if you want to have an accreditation process, who does the accreditation, right? I mean, that's the ever, you know, who watches the, who watches the monitors, right? It's, uh, who, uh, it's, the, it's, the old, uh, it's the old question from the old play about, you know, who is, who is going to be watching the watchman. Yeah. Uh, Judith Kelly, um, when people in the U.S. think of election monitoring, they think of Jimmy Carter. Yes, yes, and rightfully so, and he deserves a lot of credit for building election monitoring. Uh, he and his center, people there, and they've, they've been on the forefront too of helping to develop these standards uh, you know, in the UN as well. Uh, they have been a major movers in election monitoring, defining what it is. Um, and Carter has done a lot of good work, but, but it's important to understand there's no organization out there that has a complete ability to rid itself of any kinds of constraints, uh, you know, uh, impositions by concerns about donors, there are other operations within countries, et cetera. Even Jimmy Carter faces dilemmas about how to conduct his, his missions in different countries. So let's start, where has it worked well? So it works best where it's least glamorous, shall we say, and that's a problem. Uh, from the perspective of organizations who are trying to thrive and survive, um, you know, they, it's, it's 
costs uh, for some of these organizations, their, their livelihood or uh, is what they do. Even when they are within intergovernmental organizations, you've got sub-agencies that that's what they do. So it tends to work when the train, shall we say, is already in motion when there are reforms underway, when countries want to make reforms and they're receptive to people coming in way in advance, looking at their systems, providing the them with advice, helping them with the voter registers, helping to build domestic monitoring capacities. So this is not a revolutionary tool. It, it, it works on the margins, I would say, in places where there's not you know, a, a conflict that's, that's just been quelled, it may still be simmering. Conflict is like the worst setting for this type of election monitoring because the observers are so worried about stoking the violence further. So it works best when there's not a lot of conflict, when there's not like a win-or-take-all systems where everybody has an incentive to, uh, you know, to, 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 to push for, um, um, for winning everything. So in, in, the, uh, in the middle ground, in the middle countries that are trying to make advances, that's why it works best. We all remember purple fingers from Iraq. Yes. Were there election monitors in Iraq? Um, or there have there been throughout their series of elections? It, it, it's not been a high profile thing in Iraq with the election monitors. There's been some, but it's not, it's not been a big issue there. Congo, 2007. I, I'm sorry, Kenya, 2007. Yeah. That was, that was a big, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it's Kenya goes to show how you can make progress in one election and and then a, f a few years later the lack of follow-up or violence can have restoked and and you can have a mess again um, so in uh, you know in in it's very very difficult to set a country on a on a path where now we've fixed it and and the now they know how to run elections and it's just going to work and so in Kenya, it's been up and down with election monitoring, and um, it, it's not the election monitor's fault per se, but surely there, it's, it's a good example of where they've been very worried about being critical because of the violent potential if they if they come out and and condemn the elections. Um, yeah. You did Kelly. What do you teach here at Duke? I teach uh, introduction to public policy, policy analysis. I uh, help our undergraduates write honest theses and do research programs. And I also teach these types of topics, like tools of international pressure, ways that external actors can promote domestic reforms in other countries or not. <laughs> in Monitoring Democracy, you write, you can't vote That's anywhere right. yes. in the world. Yes. Why is that? Well, um, because I'm a Danish citizen, and the Danish laws require residency in order to vote. And I'm not an American citizen because um, uh, the Danish uh, laws don't allow dual citizenship and Americans' laws require citizenship to vote. I can't vote in either place. Had I been an American living in Denmark, ironically, I could potentially vote in two places. But uh, I can't vote anywhere. anywhere. Besides the Carter Center, what are some of the other major groups that monitor democracy that have a lot of legitimacy in international life? So um, in the United States, people might be familiar with the NDI, the National Endowment, uh, the National Democratic Institute, the IRI, the International Republican Institute. These are, are um, agencies that are I independent. Uh, they're not, you know, governmental. They're non-governmental organizations, but they sort of have a special status, um, and they uh, they do they do pretty good work. In Europe, we've got the OSC. Uh, we got various parliamentary um, organizations from the European Parliament, Council of Europe, um, that do monitoring. And of course, the European Union does a lot of monitoring. The UN still does monitoring, but not in the same sort of high-flashing way. They don't come out with public statements a lot anymore. They do a lot of electoral assistance, um, and they do more in conflict setting support of other monitoring organizations. Um, but we're seeing organizations pop up all over the world now, uh, regional organizations in Africa, um, as the South African Development uh, uh, Community, um, different, uh, the African Union, of course, does uh, um, uh, election monitoring, the Commonwealth Secretariat, um, and even in Asia, we've got organizations like ANFREL and uh, you know, other organizations popping up. Um, you know, which ones are the more credible ones? Um, uh, you know, it's, it varies. Um, I, would, I would put my money mostly, I would say, on, I think the